Um, let me introduce Terry, who's Terry is certainly someone who needs no introduction, but I'll try anyway. Uh, Terry's advisor was John Hopfield of Hopfield Network fame. Now, not to be outdone, Terry with Jeff Hinton invented Boltzmann machines, which is basically a probabilistic Hopfield network with simulated annealing. And the Boltzmann machine was one of the first networks with a learning role before Backprop was rediscovered. Uh, Terry is a member of three or four national academies. I lost track. Okay, at least National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Medicine. Let's do the numbers. His H index is 173 with 163,099 citations, probably 100 by now. Um, Terry's won more prizes than uh, he can count, and let's let's welcome Terry. Oh, well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I was once being introduced or being to say a lecture, and the person introducing me said, uh, Terry needs a good introduction. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, uh, thank you very much, uh, Terry, for that introduction. So uh, I think everybody here, now how do I hide this? Staying on the top. Uh, go to the dot, 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 go down to hide floating meeting controls right there. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. <clears throat> okay, so um, not everybody has heard about chat GPT. Uh, three months ago, the public didn't know anything about uh, the transformation that has occurred in artificial intelligence over the last three years because of these large transformers. models. But now the whole world knows. Um, in fact, uh, uh, even before the discussion started in the world, it was raging in uh, the world of AI. Tremendous variability in terms of uh, how individuals saw uh, GPD and these uh, large language models. <clears throat> Some of them. Uh, you know, question whether or not they understood what they were saying or whether they're intelligent. Others were testing it and came to the conclusion that it was very intelligent. In fact, one who was a software engineer at Google who, who claimed that it was sentient, he got fired. But uh, nonetheless, the high variance means it was a very interesting phenomenon going in here, something that really is uh, it's as if an alien suddenly appeared on the earth and talked to us in English, right? It's that shocking. The only thing that is clear is that these large language models are not human. But what, then what are they, right? We, that's our job to figure that out because we created them. Okay, I'm gonna begin with a story. And this is a story about a talking dog. And it starts in the backwoods of the uh, countryside and a driver is, is uh, driving along and there's a sign, a talking dog for sale. So the farmer, uh, he goes to the farmer and the farmer takes him to the backyard and there's a border colony. And the border colony says, wolf, wolf. My name is Carl, please meet you. Now, the driver is really surprised uh, that he's talking to a dog. And he asked the dog, he said, where did you learn how to talk? And the dog says, well, I went to uh, an experimental uh, language class organized by the CIA. And they taught me three languages, English, Chinese, and Russian. And now the, now the driver is astonished and says, what did you do for the CIA? And the, the, Carl says, oh, well, CIA would send me around the world and I sit in a corner and listen to the negotiations. And when uh, the Russians were talking amongst themselves, you know, the diplomats and the uh, Russian agents, 
I overheard what they were saying and I reported back to the CIA. Now the driver is completely astonished and, you know, and says, you were a spy for the CIA? And Carl says, well, I retired a few years ago and uh, they gave me the intelligence cross by his honor from the CIA and they made me an honorary citizen of the United States. So he, he, at this point, he's in shock. He goes back to the farmer. The son is going to the dog. The farmer says, the dogs. And the driver says, you're going to sell this amazing dog for $10? He didn't believe all that bullshit about the CIA, did you? <laughs> well, what's going on here, I think, is very similar to what's going on with the talking dog. It's literally talking to us in English. And now the question is, does it really understand what it's saying? Um, some of the people at home would like to see you while you're talking. I don't have a video here. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry that uh, we don't have a complete uh, video, but uh, I think uh, the voice should help. Okay, so I'm going to, first of all, give a little bit of a history uh, of natural language processing just to set the stage. And if I can advance the slide, which I apparently can't. <laughs> no, okay. We're going to start back in 1986. So 1986, I was at Johns Hopkins University. And this was uh, when Backrock, actually, the first year that Backrock was introduced. And uh, by the way, uh, oh, good, thank you. <laughs> by the way, uh, it's true that the, the algorithm itself it goes way back to uh, in control theory, actually, to a, a book by Co. Uh, but this this was the first application to neural networks. Uh, and uh, Bryson and Ho is the book. They were the authors on the control theory book, and it goes back, I think, to the sixties. Oh, okay. Great. We see you okay, there. Gary, this is wonderful. Thank you. Hello out there in Zoom. Uh, okay, so Bryson and Ho. Uh, so this was at the time the largest model that uh, had been developed. Computers are really slow. We used uh, VAX, which was uh, like a megahertz compared to now, you know, your cell phone's doing gigahertz. The network, uh, as you can see here, uh, took in a sequence of seven letters and it tried to assign the sound, the phony, to the middle letter. And like the C and CAD is a hard C, K. If it was a soft C, like if it was C-I-T-Y, then it should be uh, the soft C, SIT. And there's one layer of hidden units. That's all we could afford back then with the computing. And then uh, we had a training set. And we trained it. And uh, remarkably, it did remarkably well. I'm going to demonstrate that in a moment. This network had a total of 200 units, 20,000 weights, right? That is tiny by today's standards. However, this particular problem, which is text-to-speech, is actually a very difficult one. And especially for those of you who have to learn English as a second language, it's very, English is very irregular. Now there are regularities, there are rule-like regularities, but for every rule, there are a list of exceptions. Amongst the exceptions, there are rules. It depends if it comes from French or German, then it might have a different, um, you know, sort, sort of uh, context that has to be, that's different from other words, other, other, uh, other languages. And if you, if you go to the uh, phonology textbooks, you know, they're like 500 pages filled with rules and exceptions, right? It's rules all the way down. This little network was able to master those rules and exceptions, same architecture with the very, very uh, modest, modest resources. Okay, so I'm going to now actually. Uh, switch to a video, which uh, this this video popped up recently. 
uh, Gerald Powell actually found it was a documentary. I was yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's actually uh, the best explanation uh, for the public, uh, better than I could give. Would, would everyone oh. mute except Terry? Oh, okay, stop share. Okay, so I'll stop share. And now I am. Can you see that? Oh, I have to share it again then. Yeah. Okay. So well, this is, but I've I've given up the. Let's see. Where's the Zoom? That's scary. Okay, I've got to get back. I still can't see that. Would everyone mute, please? Oh, at the top, there's a green arrow. I don't see a green arrow. Come on. Here is oh, that place. Okay. And then you can share again. Oh, share again. Thank you. Like the whole screen. Okay. Sorry about that. Share your screen, and that way anything you show show up. Okay. So go up in the upper left corner and click on screen. Switch on screen. This one. Screen yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. Now I will share that. Yeah. Share. Okay. Okay, I think I'm sharing. Oh, lower right. Okay. Share. Okay. There it is. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. Everybody sees that. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Now, this is a short clip, about a minute long, but I, I have to say that, uh, like I say, it, it's historic, right? It's kind of an interesting clip. You're going to hear first what the network sounds like at the very beginning of the training. And it won't sound like words, but it'll sound like attempts that will get better and better with time. So it starts out babbling at the very beginning of the training. Takes the ladders, say the phrase grandmother's house, and makes a random attempt at pronouncing it. Grandmother's house. The phonetic difference between the guess and the right pronunciation is sent back through the network. I can go take dog. Grandmother's house. By adjusting the connection strengths after each attempt, the net slowly improves. And finally, after uh, letting a train overnight, uh, the next morning, it sounds like this. Grandmother's house. I like to go to my grandmother's house. Well, because he gives us candy. Okay, so I think that makes the point. Now I have to get back to the. Okay, I'm, I'm, I think you can see that. Is that okay? Wonderful. I've learned how to do that one trial learning. Uh, Okay, so that was a training set, right? And now I'm going to show you what how it generalizes to new text. By the way, this is a, a text that's a book actually, which is a transcription of a of a, a kid from a barrio in Los Angeles. And what they did was they on the left side they have the let the words, and on the right side the actual phonemes that the, <coughs> the person the phonologist actually decoded, which is a little bit different actually from. Uh, our English, but in any case, here here is uh, now the test set. I walk over with two friends, and sometimes we can't run over from school now. Okay, so it passes the test, and actually, this is a really important issue. It's uh, all about generalization. There's no way that NetTalk could have memorized all of the words that it was trained on and then generalized because it, it wouldn't generalize to new words, right? That are not in the training corpus. And this is a misunderstanding that's in the press and it's a misunderstanding 
amongst people who are naysayers, they think that it's a stochastic parrot. <laughs> well, well, first of all, this is really misdemeaning to parrots, right? Second of all, it's no, there's no way it's gonna memorize. It has to be able to uh, answer questions that it's never heard before and, and come up with syntactically correct answers, right? And that means that it has to be able to generalize. <laughs> it has to be able to understand something about syntax, right? You may not believe what it's saying, but it, you have to believe what you're reading. That is to say, you have to believe the fact that it actually seems to understand syntax and it seems to understand coherent sentences and paragraphs. And, and that's really what's, I think, the surprise. And that's why we're trying to understand it. Okay, so now, Fast forward to 2012, and this is when uh, Jeff Hinton and his students uh, won the prize for ImageNet, a very large corpus of images, 20 million images, 20,000 categories, using convolutional neural network with many layers, a deep learning network. And uh, it, you know, historically, it, uh, the computer vision community was improving by about 1% a year on that uh, very, very large uh, you know, set of, of, of images. And in one year, uh, Jeff just uh, sent the field 20 years into the future, right? So it, it didn't take long because they couldn't compete uh, for everybody to be, of course, uh, adopting this new architecture. Now, from the very beginning of AI, uh, natural language was a holy grail, especially language uh, translation. And this is from, uh, as you probably recognize, uh, Captain uh, Kirk of the Starship Enterprise in Star Trek. Uh, by the way, that took place in the 23rd century, right? <laughs> and they had a language translator. It's a language translator that you could hold in your own hand, right, like this. Well, today, if you look at your cell phone, there is an app that will do translation for you. So for all practical purposes, uh, the universal translator here in science fiction was, is actually something that has happened. And how did it happen? So here is a first generation of uh, a translation, a recurrent neural network. Now these are ones that have feedback loops within the network as shown here on the right, uh, bottom right. And what you see here is uh, words coming in one at a time. Each of the vertical slots is a time step. And, and what happens is that uh, the activity circulates in the network until you get to the end of the sentence, and then the output comes out one word at a time. Uh, this is trained with backpropagation through time. This is basically RNN. This is an RNN, as you can see here. Is there a laser pointer? I guess it doesn't matter here. <laughs> uh, okay, there, there is a... In the bottom right-hand corner here, you see the uh, the network with the red, the hidden units are in blue. Does everybody see that? And there's a feedback connection, right? That's a recurrent neural network. You can have many layers and you know you can make it as complex as you want, but basically the difference from a feed-forward network and a recurrent neural network is enormous because of the fact that you have circulating information. And the reason why it has to circulate is that when you get to the last word, you have to connect it to the first word. They may be related to each other. So therefore, you have to have some way for the information to be circulating in the network over time. Now, the second big advance was, uh, again, using recurrent neural networks is, was word embeddings. And the way that they trained the network was by taking in sentences and then training it to predict the next word. Now that's self-supervised. You don't have to label anything. And at the end of the training, uh, they, for every word, they had an embedding into the activity pattern of all the units in the network, which could be, you know, hundreds of thousands, depending on the size of the network. But the point, though, is you can now analyze that space, that high dimensional space, and lo and behold, words were clustered. For example, on the left here, you can see the names of countries. They're all separated for you very nicely. And on the right, in a different part of the space, this is all projected onto 2D, by the way. It's, it's a million dimensional space, are the names of capitals. But in addition, you can see that if you draw an arrow between say, uh, China and Beijing, uh, that arrow there is, if you take it and 
move it to, say, Italy, it will point to Rome. In other words, not only are categories implicit, which is semantic categories in the space, but relationships between categories in the metrics of the space. So this is a very important because now what people did, instead of putting words in, they put in the embedding. So now they had a very large vector that they used as the input, which had a lot of semantic information in it, rather than the actual word, which is just a symbol. Now, <laughs> mathematicians noticed this and wondered, how is it possible for this to happen? And here's a really interesting uh, archive paper. So it, 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 it you know, we, we've known since, uh, you know, uh, the Chomsky and uh, the, all the work he did on syntax in the 20th century, that uh, recursion makes it possible to create an infinite number of sentences. And, and uh, it's a tree, and a, there is a way for it to, uh, the information to flow, so you understand what the sentence is through these, this recursion. So here's a, this archive paper uh, from Google, Chris Manning's group. And <clears throat> what they have shown here is that they've analyzed recurrent networks and show that they generate bounded hierarchical languages with optimal memory. What does that mean? Bounded means only a certain finite level of recursion, but with whatever the level of recursion is, it uses the minimum amount of memory in order to be able to keep track of the recursion of, of new inputs that are coming in. This is really, very, it's an insight. It's telling us recurrent networks are actually very powerful for doing recursion, something that we thought is important in language. Now, I, what I wanna do now is to jump into the future. And I wanna show you how NetTalk uh, compares with some of the other language models. You see on the bottom left-hand corner, NetTalk. Well, the vertical axis is the amount of computing that you need in order to train the network in petaflop days. Petaflops, you know, supercomputer level. And, um, and on the, on the x-axis, you'll see the time, and you can see that there is a progression from NetTalk, which, uh, you know, like I said, really was um, barely a computer back then, uh, all the way up to 2012, uh, following Moore's Law, which is 1.8 months per doubling. So what happened in 2012 was that GPUs became available to people doing neural network training. And that meant that uh, because there are many, many cores and they do uh, vector operations with matrices, it was possible to have uh, it, it literally over numbers overnight, a two orders of magnitude more computing power. And that meant that it was doubled, and then it was doubling every 3.4 months, which is about five times faster than Moore's law. So uh, there you go, you can see AlexNet, that's the network that, uh, uh, that Jeff uh, and his students developed. Uh, Alex Kruszewski, and then going up, we can see it's uh, uh, AlphaGo, right? Uh, 2017, when coupling deep learning with re reinforcement learning, they were able to beat the world Go champion. So that, that, that's uh, you know, amazing. So what it means is, and this is now uh, for many, many, many different problems, including protein folding, the bigger the network, the more power it has to solve more and more difficult problems. Now, you can see the large language models on the right here with the red dash line is doubling every two months, starting with BERT. GPT-3 there is at the top, and if you compare the amount of computing power that went into GPT-3 to train it, one network with 175 billion parameters compared to NetTalk, that's a million, million times more computing power. And so what does that buy you? What it buys you is a generative model and this is different from convolutional learning networks. You give it one input, you give it an output. Here, you put in one query, which it could be a sentence or a paragraph, and out comes a whole sequence of words. It's generative. In fact, it's a lot like you, when you're giving a talk, you generate a sequence of words, right? So this is why I think it's captured the public imagination. Gary has a question. So you have a driver. What? You have a driver. Oh, okay. I'm going to get to that. Okay, Gary's. You're driving the language. Well, G Gary is right. Gary is right. Okay, so somewhere in the middle of your head, Gary, there's a little man, right, who's 
pressing the buttons, right? Stay with that, I'll come back to that later. <laughs> okay. Now, there, it's not just that it becomes more powerful, but it turns out there's a threshold. If you're below threshold, you can't solve the problem. If you're above the threshold, you can. And the more, the larger the network, the more the weights, the better the performance. And, and this is shown here uh, in uh, eight different tasks. So I'm not going to go into any detail, accuracy on the vertical axis. And uh, the dashed red line is random. So you can see that, um, uh, you know, let, let's, let's look at uh, one of them. Uh, let's, let's, uh, by the way, there, there's a bunch of, uh, of different lang large language models. So you can, they, they all more or less have the inflection at the same place. Just look, look at the arithmetic on the upper left. You can see it basically gets nothing until it gets up to about 10 megabytes, me, me, uh, mega weights uh, in terms of the uh, number of the complexity of the network. And once you get above that, it just keeps getting better and better and better, right? And so this is true of all of these tasks. Uh, it means there's a phase transition. It means that there's something that uh, you can't do until you have a large enough brain. And then after that, it gets better and better and better the bigger your brain. And of course, that's what nature discovered a long time ago. So what we see here are the brains of four primates, starting on the left with the squirrel monkey. And this is two size. In other words, this is an accurate uh, photo. Uh, but the, the macaque, you can see, is a, a lab animal. It's used for vision research. The chimp, our nearest relative. And then finally, the human. You can see that the cortex, the outside, has vastly increased in surface area. It's about the size of a dinner napkin, about 1,000 square centimeters. And uh, it has especially expanded in the prefrontal part of the brain, which is the part for planning. So nature already discovered this. It was already there. And how is it doing this expansion? Well, it turns out that the cortex, the, the algorithm that creates the six-layer cortex can be easily replicated. You just say, you know, go through the cycle of creating more neurons, and you, you can now have twice as much cortex, and now you can connect them up. That requires some more instructions, but it's basically an algorithm for during development, which can be scaled up. Not true of many other brain areas, by the way. It's not the, the case for the hypothalamus, which controls your autonomy. Uh, it's not the case for the spinal cord, for example. Okay, now we get to the transformer, which is truly transformative. And uh, I think most of you probably, oops, how did I get this back? Uh, you probably had to escape. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't want to do that. Okay. So uh, this is something that all of you are probably familiar with, but if not, let me just say that uh, you, you need a query, you need a question, you need a text or an example. You put that into the input and out comes the, uh, it's encoded. Uh, and then it's put into the decoder, which, as you can see, has a big loop. Uh, there, there, it's one module being shown, and you can stack them uh, X times. And then, then uh, what happens is the word that comes out of the top, there's really probabilities. You pick the highest probability, or you can add a little bit of temperature, so you can sometimes pick the, the not the likeliest, but maybe the next likely. So there's a little bit of stochasticity here. You can vary that, the temperature knob on GPT. And, uh, and then you take that word that comes out the top and you put it, you add it to the words that are going in the input and round and around we go, producing Michelangelo. A really elegant text. Uh, <clears throat> now there's a couple of features which are unusual that are different in the uh, transformer, which I think are the source of their power. First of all, the input embedding doesn't give it one word at a time. It actually takes all the words, they're called tokens, and strings them together into one long vector. And it adds positional information about what this place in the sentence it is. One, two, three, four, five. So there's, it's all encoded in one vector. It means you don't have to worry about the connecting the first and the last. So how do you connect the first and the last? You do it with something called multi-head attention. Attention it's really a matrix. It's a matrix that says, what is the association, the strength of the association between two wor words in the input or in, in the, in the uh, text that's coming through? And, uh, the, and that, those associations are learned along with the weights in the network. Uh, 
And that's really important because that, that really gives you context. Attention is very important in humans. And, and I'll come back to this in a moment. Uh, okay, well, that's the, <laughs> that's why it's called generative because of this loop. Interestingly, if you look into the human brain, if we can figure out how to advance, I think it doesn't, it's either, maybe it's too slow. Okay, well. Sure. There we go. Okay, see, see I, I got that one. Okay, uh, okay. So now I'm going to compare the transformer to the human brain, and I'm going to go on the limb here because of the fact that we really don't understand very much about how the human brain works, but transformers may help us understand how it works. Okay, so uh, you see on the left what you saw in the last slide. And on the right is a cartoon of uh, the cortex on the top and the part of the brain just below it called the basal ganglion, just below it. And what you can see is that there's a loop between the cortex and the basal ganglion that goes up and around and around about 10 times per second. Now, what you're seeing at the top in colors is the motor cortex in which there's a homunculus. Remember, Gary, I'm coming back to you. There you are, uh, which is a, a, a map of the body parts on the surface of the cortex. So there's a part that controls the face, this is the motor cortex, part that controls arms and, and then the legs uh, and so forth. And, and it's topographically organized. It projects down to the uh, basal ganglia, which is also topographically organized. But if, there's a lot, there's massive convergence there. That's to say that the basal ganglia is able to combine information from many different parts, not just the motor cortex, but the premotor cortex and the sensory motor cortex and the prefrontal cortex. And it's combining that information. And, and on the basis of, of that information, it decides on make, what action to take next. It, it decides and it reports that back to the cortex. Now, the basal ganglia we've known for a long time is not only can it sequence actions, but it can learn actions. For example, when you're learning to play tennis, it's because of reinforcement learning in the basal ganglion. In fact, we even know the algorithm is temporal difference learning. This is RL, right from AI. Uh, and the, the dopamine neurons as a neuromodulator are doing reward prediction error, right? So this is, I think, a, a rough, it roughly maps onto the transformer architecture, this big loop. And this, uh, I think that the multi-headed attention is what's in the basal ganglion, right? Comparing relationships between different parts of the cortex, the whole cortex. So much more powerful. By the way, uh, how many of these loops are there? Okay, in, in a square centimeter, there are about 100 billion synapses or weights, strengths of connection. And there are about 1,000 square centimeters in the cortex. That means there's about 1,000 of today's transformers. And each one of the transformers is controlling some part of the body, some set of actions, some, some sort of planning in the prefrontal cortex. In fact, if you just think about what happens when you sit there and you think, right, this is Gary now saying, where's it coming from? There's a transformer in his prefrontal cortex, which is circulating thoughts through the basal ganglia, one thought at a time, right? You have to decide, you can't think of 10 things at the same time, but you can, you can subcortically and subconsciously think of 10 things, but only one of them is gonna be expressed in your consciousness, one at a time. Well, some of us are more advanced uh, life forms. Yes. So transformers that have this beautiful self-attaining mechanism that they got and kind of thing. But for the basic RNs, you can have the encoder decoded this autoregressive gen model. So what is so special from high level as making transformers different from RN from this thing? Oh, oh no, it is. It's a it's a it's a specialized RNN. This is because of the feedback loop, it's an RNN. You're absolutely right. It's just a type of RNN. And you know, this is also brings us to the issue of architectures, right? There's an infinite number of architectures. We've just begun to explore 
that space. And uh, nature has been there before us. So uh, we're now, <laughs> what's interesting now is that uh, the exploration in AI is feeding back to people who under want to understand the brain, right? Because this might help us understand how the brain works. Now, there, there's another piece here, which uh, you don't see in the brain, which is this uh, embedding of the inputs into a long vector, right? Because we hear words coming in one at a time, or if, in the case of movies, one frame at a time. And so it looks as if, well, maybe it's not quite the same as a transform. Okay, well, let's come back to that later. You know, this is getting, well, I mean, it's, if, if I don't hit escape, I'm not gonna progress. Okay. I'm just gonna leave this up, what the hell? Okay, okay. So at, oh, okay, okay. So um, at the same time that there's this revolution going on in AI, it's been going on for 10 years and it's, it's accelerating. There has been a revolution in neuroscience. And it started in 2013. This is our former president, Barack Obama, who was announcing his signature science and engineering grand challenge, the brain image. I was in the East Room watching this in real time, live. I was blown away with how, you know, the announcement went out over the radio, the television radio, but, but if you were actually there, he gave, the, the best justification for basic science and basic research that I've heard anybody, get, any scientist, or he was much more eloquent and much more uh, you know, forward-looking visionary than uh, a lot of his colleagues. Well, he did say, I think that he hoped this initiative would help understand what's going on in Washington. Well, it, you know, it, it, I'll tell you, this was the only initiative that uh, probably it, it received by a partisan support and probably the only one that would. And I think the reason is that everybody in Washington, including the congressmen, have brains. <laughs> and, so, and some of them aren't working very well. And so it's in their self-interest to try to understand what's going on, right? So, uh, but, it, it, but in any case, this set off, as you can see here, uh, the I in the N in brain is innovative neurotechnology. The goal was not to cure disease, but rather, to develop new tools for recording for more neurons and coming up with a, a census of all the different types of neurons and of how are they connected. That's called connectomics and so forth. There's a whole list of, 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 of goals. And I was on the committee at NIH to, to advise the director, Francis Collins, of how it should be organized. In other words, what are the goals and, and what are the milestones? To my surprise, 10 years later, this uh, initiative has exceeded our goals. It's now possible to record simultaneously from a million neurons at a time in the 20th century because of the fact that the microelectric only record from one neuron at a time. It was very, very slow going, but now we can record from a whole population and dozens of parts of the brain. And what it's telling us is that what we thought our conceptual framework in the 20th century is completely wrong. And, and I, I, I that would take another lecture to explain this to you, but I'm gonna give you just one example. This is the brain of a larval zebrafish. And it, it can, like a minnow, it kind of goes through the water and it, and it eats bacteria. Uh, and what you're seeing are you know these little green dots are single neurons that are being activated uh, through a fluorescent dye. And, and uh, 80,000 neurons, this is a, practically the entire brain of that small creature. And if you look at it, it's not random. There, you see a lot of neurons suddenly become activated. And that is the, probably because of the fact that the, uh, the, the larva was, uh, try, was planning an action, or maybe it had a thought. We don't know, because this is generative, right? That's the whole idea of generative is that you can't know because there's no external, this was, this animal did, wasn't able to move. It was in a gel. Okay, that's the technology that is now available to us. Okay, now I wanna to jump to another part of the brain uh, where large scale uh, recordings have been made. That's the hippocampus. 
The hippocampus is a part of the brain that's very important for long-term memory. If it's damaged, then you can't remember, you have amnesia, you can't remember what happened to you 10 minutes ago. Famous HM patient who had bilateral temporal hippocampectomy. Okay, so uh, this goes back now to uh, early uh, recordings in arrays of electrodes that were put into the hippocampus of a rat as it was going through a, uh, as in this case, uh, down a, a one-dimensional uh, ramp and, and inside the uh, hippocampus, there are single neurons called place fields with place fields uh, that fire only when the rat is at a particular location. And here are seven neurons that have place fields in seven locations along that ramp. Okay. And then, by the way, there are thousands of these in, in the rat hippocampus. And, and if you put it into a new enclosure, it'll have new place fields in different locations, right? Now, what's interesting is that when the rat goes to sleep, it replays the sequence, but it plays it a factor of 10 times faster. So you can see that uh, the time scale here is uh, basically a few hundred milliseconds, a few tenths of a millisecond. Here, it's on the order of, of, of 10 seconds. So what's going on when it's asleep is that it's replaying its experience to the cortex. And the cortex is now integrating that information into your world knowledge, semantic knowledge, and your, uh, uh, your uh, by the way, it's important for events, right? Events, uh, specific events and specific objects, right? Unique things. You, you know, the, the world knowledge is in your cortex, but you have to add to it. And that's what is going on when you fall asleep. Uh, called memory consolidation. So I'm gonna just very briefly tell you that uh, one of the projects in my lab that is going to be uh, published soon is a model of the hippocampus. I, as I said, it seems to remember sequences. So maybe there's a learning algorithm here. Uh, you, you see on the left is the cortex in red, six layer. And one of the outputs uh, goes to the hippocampus uh, shown on the right. Uh, it, it goes through uh, the dentate gyrus, which uh, sparsifies the activity pattern. That goes to a recurrent network, CA3. And from there, it goes to the output, CA1, which feed forward, takes you back to the cortex. There's a loop here. And I'm going to simplify that. This is work of UC Chen, whose uh, thesis uh, project is going to be finished soon. Uh, on the bottom left corner, you can see uh, a very simple model, okay, it's the auto, uh, <laughs> it's the cortex goes to a recurrent network, which then goes to a CA1, right? Now, that has the structure of an autoencoder, right? That is to say, the input goes to a recurrent network, and a sequence of inputs comes in, and now the CA1, you have to train the network uh, with the weights so that the CA1 reflects the exact input as the cortex, right? And if you can do that, uh, you can store the sequence, but that's not very efficient, it turns out. But if you do what's called a predictive autoencoder, and what you do is you predict not the current input, but the next input, you predict the next input, then it can learn remarkably well many sequences. And so how does that work? So we use MNIST and, and two examples of handwritten digits are shown on the top, they're slightly different from different people. But we use all of these to train up the, the sequences through predictive autoencoding. And then uh, uh, once you've done that, uh, it now has learned the sequence, which generalizes across all the uh, specifics of all the individual inputs. And now what you can do is you just have to give it the first few. In fact, you can give it the first one and it will autocomplete, right? So it has remembered the sequence. And if you analyze the activity patterns using independent component analysis, each of those uh, uh, digits is actually located in a different part of the space, of activity space. So it's, 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 it's been able to, the network through learning has been able to, uh, first of all, recognize uh, all of the, the different numerals, but also being able to sequence them together uh, in the recurrent network. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail because of the fact that we're late, but it, could, it learns how to rotate objects and, and uh, not only that, it segregates them and also uh, the activity rotates within the network. Uh, you can also train it on these sprites, which are little 
creatures which have uh, different actions. They can walk, they can use their arms, and uh, you can do it from different directions. And it, it, it actually, as you can see, from nine different uh, frame, uh, uh, sequence of video frames, uh, it's able to segregate them. And then you just give it the first one and it can repeat any one of these, the sequence on the output from that particular sequence of uh, motions. Now, here is where technology comes in. Because up to now, all of these recordings were from single neurons. And now the question is, what happens if we look at all of them at the same time in the hippocampus? And here is a movie. This is from Thanos Siapas at Caltech. And the little uh, yellow dots are the, the, the electrodes. And I'm going to play a movie. And what I've done is color coded it so that if the uh, activity is high, it's, it's yellow. And if it's low, it's blue. These are actually not single neurons. These are actually local field potentials, which is the summation of, of, of the synaptic interactions locally. OK, so where is the? Here we go. OK. Oh, that's too bad. It looked like it, but it didn't. But now let's try it here. Reset. There we go. It looked like it was trying. Do you think right click will work? Oh, no, I don't want that. Sorry. Doesn't want to. There we go. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to uh, play with this, but I'll tell you what you would see if you said there's a wave of activity that goes across from left to right. In other words, uh, and it's about four per second, which is called the theta rhythm. And this is a, a way of organizing spatially the activity patterns from single neurons. Okay, so uh, this is interesting. So there are traveling waves in the hippocampus. Where else can you find traveling waves? And it turns out that you can find them in your brain too while you're sleeping. And here is another movie, which you're not going to see. Oh, hey, I think I'm going to see, show you this. Okay. Now, th these are arrays of electrodes that are placed into the cortex of epilepsy patients in order to localize where the seizure starts. Okay. So that's where the data are taken. This is from Sid Cash at MGH. And so we analyze his data during sleep spindles. Normally, you know, they just record continuously for one or two weeks. So we have an enormous amount of data that we get from humans. Uh, and Terry, you have to share your screen. For a long time in cats and other animals, and we know a lot about right, them yeah. by a physical awesome. perspective. But the question is, what's the spatial organization across the cortex? And it had been thought uh, by the experts that it was synchronous across the whole cortex. But I'm going to show you that it's not quite synchronous. Um, you're not screen sharing anymore. I'm not screen sharing. Oh, okay. Maybe that's where it works. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's go back to screen sharing. Get rid of this and go back to Zoom. Share screen. And you say I can do that now here. So I will share the screen. I think there's something wrong with the screen sharing when I do the whole screen, but um, sorry that it's taking this long, but now let's see if I can get the Oh, I think it's going to work. There it is. Okay, miracle of miracles. You can see that the white, follow the white dots as they go from the temporal, from the prefrontal cortex, the temporal cortex, the parietal cortex, round and around 10 times per second. These sleep symbols last for about two seconds and, and uh, they're about 10 hertz. And it happens thousands of times during the night. And the more spindles you have, the better you remember things that happened the previous day. So it improves memory.
So it's really, it's really quite remarkable, and we know a lot about it. If you, uh, if you, if you just take the raw data that I showed you and then look at uh, the direction where the phase is increasing the fastest, you get this beautiful spiral pattern. There are other patterns too. Sometimes it reverses and goes the other way. We call them Princess Leia waves. <laughs> now, we were <clears throat> criticized by colleagues because they said this could be an artifact of the fact that these poor patients have epilepsy. Maybe it's not normal. So we teamed up with April Benesich, who studies babies. And here's a, a baby that is sleeping with high density EEG electrodes. And I use using the very same. Uh, the very same uh, gray level where uh, white is plus one and black is minus one. We're going to see what it looks like. Look into the brain of the baby while it is dreaming sleep spindles. So now you can see it, it's bilateral across the whole cortex. So it's really global. It just sweeps back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So this is really quite remarkable and babies love to sleep. The reason why we're gonna be able to do this uh, from the outside is the babies at this age, you know, the six to 18 months, it's very, very thin cartilaginous. In fact, so it's almost like being on the surface of the cortex. Now, it turns out that uh, oscillations in the brain are all traveling waves. There's a lot of different frequency bands and this is a frequency band, which is in the 10 to 15 Hertz range. It was a recording that was made with an array of electrodes by John Reynolds, a colleague at the Salk. And what this shows uh, is uh, <clears throat> in the panels uh, from left to right, and you can see, first of all, you can see the oscillation in the upper right hand corner and you can see the red panel uh, and, and it goes of uh, 32 milliseconds as the wave goes through that patch. It's a uh, hundred electrodes that are embedded in the cortex. And you can see the red wave of excitation goes from top left down to bottom right in 32 milliseconds. So, th so there, this is now an awake behaving monkey, right? It's happening in your brain. It happens in the gamma range, which is important for memory and attention, 30 to 80 Hertz. All of, the, all of the, the oscillations that people have reported, alpha waves, alpha, for example, was one of the biggest ones that was very first uh, uh, recordings from the scalp in the microvolt range uh, was alpha, which is 10 Hertz. And okay, so that's interesting. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I can't advance it. I'm going to stop share. This is really embarrassing. Okay. 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 So now the penny is going to drop. Oh, my going to show you. Okay. But you know, it's, it's so nice to be able to advance, you know. Um, okay. So here we go. Let's go to Zoom. And, um, and here we go. Share screen. Okay, if, if you can do this better than I can. Yeah, yeah I, I think let's try another way. Uh, let's share the the window, the power screen to only. Ah, okay. I, I, I guess, I no, 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 I can't. I, I, oh, how to, how to. Okay. Is it better? Okay. Uh, let's try. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's already share yeah. screen. Yeah. Okay, let's just try that. And uh, let's hide again. I, I okay. This time it will there work, I guess. Okay. So, okay, everybody should see right. this. Time. Okay. Okay. So the penny is going to drop. Okay. So, why? I mean, this is these traveling waves have been there and they've been seen for dozens of years, but ignored. And people have ignored them because the conceptual framework is that the input comes in synchronously across the retina. It goes up to V1 and then synchronously goes to V2, V3, all the way up to the hippocampus, right? So that's that's the uh, the traditional view of, and you get that recorded by one neuron at a time, right? It, 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 
that latency goes up as you go up, obviously, because it has to go each step up to the top. But what I'm telling you is that there are traveling ways. And in fact, uh, there are spontaneous traveling ways, like the ones you saw in MT, the, in the monkey cortex. But there are also stimulus-induced uh, traveling ways, like when you throw a pebble into a pond and you see ripples. Now, what's happening is that the activity from that neuron or that small group of neurons that were activated, that activity spreads to neighboring neurons. There are lateral connections within the cortex, right? Uh, the, the, the long range horizontal connections are called. Now, another input comes in and you're gonna get another ripple from another place on the retina, uh, on the in the cortex from the retina. <clears throat> and here's an experiment that was done actually <clears throat> by physicists and this is uh, it's, it's the, this is to give you a sense for what you can do if, in, in, if you're looking, working with the physical system rather than something as complex as the brain. <clears throat> what they did was they had a, a bath of oil and they put a polystyrene beam that they shot into it and it bounced a bunch of times. Now, what you can see on the left is the fact that uh, after a couple of bounces, the traveling the waves that are emanating from each bounce are interfering, producing a pattern, a spatial pattern across the oil bath, right? Now, what they were able to show is that just taking a snapshot after 10 bounces and looking at those interferences, you can reconstruct the whole temporal sequence of where the bounces occurred and when, right? In other words, all the information about what happened in the oil bath were encoded in these holographic-like interference patterns. Now let's think about that from the perspective of the brain. As I just told you that these traveling waves are there, spreading information across the surface of the cortex and combining with information coming in at the next time step and the next time step. So what that means is that it's possible to encode a whole sequence of inputs as a spatial pattern, just as this, uh, as they showed here. Uh, the, the sequence of locations is can be deduced from it's encoded information is is present so uh, it can be extracted from that pattern from a snapshot and so if that's true it means that traveling ways may be the way that nature that the brain is able to encode long sequences into a spatial pattern that now can be used like in the large language models you know, the embedding, the very first input vector, right? That's something that could be going on in the brain. So again, I've known about these traveling waves for, you know, at least 10, 15 years, but it wasn't until transformers occurred that it, it suddenly the penny dropped and I said, well, that could be the function of these traveling waves. And it could be why it was ignored universally by neuroscientists because of the fact that it didn't seem to have any function, any computational function, but now we have one. So I think this is a way for AI to inform neuroscientists, certainly informed me. Now, finally, I just wanna end with this uh, very interesting hypothesis. Okay, so priming is incredibly important. When you use GPT, it's really important. Some people are better at this than others. It's very important that uh, you take the pre-trained model and you give it a prompt. The purpose is to help they prepare the dialogue and uh, you give them the example and the idea is to guide the behavior of the large language model, right? You're, you're guiding it just the way you would a, a sailboat. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that it's a form of one-shot learning. It's as if you know, you're telling the network what it is you want. And now the network, okay, depending on how good you are explaining what you want, will try to reflect back to you what you want. So this is a dialogue with Blas Aguera y Arcas. He's a, uh, at, he has a group at uh, Google. And I'm not going to go through this except to say that this is a uh, dialogue uh, where he talks about uh, three little kids, Ramesh, Mateo, and Lucy, in the kindergarten class, and, and they're interacting with each other. And, he, and, and uh, something happens, uh, and he asks, what do you think Lucy is thinking? So this is a, called the theory of mind. You have, to, you have to, if you observe something happening, 
you have an idea of what's going on in the person's mind. What made that person say that or do that? You have a model of that person's mind. And this is a dialogue which indicated to him that these G GDP kept asking uh, Lambda, which is the Google version of the uh, large language model, uh, and, 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 and it ex explained what a human would say, right? Uh, Ramesh was pleased that Lucy is learning that Mateo may not always be a good player. It's like three deep. Now, now this is even more interesting. And when Matteo opens his hand, okay, he has a, he has a, uh, he's been given a gift, which is a flower, and uh, what, and he squeezes it, and then he, you ask Lambda, uh, what happens when you open? When he opens his hand, and says there should be a crushed, once lovely yellow flower in his fist. Lambda has never experienced any flower getting crushed in anybody's hand because it doesn't have a hand. It doesn't, can't even see a flower being crushed. Somehow it intuited that from the text, which, which is really amazing. So it means that there's more information in the text than you can imagine. Now, to contrast that with the opposite side, that, that was a side where, by God, these language models have a theory of mind, and that's considered to be of an important part of higher order cognitive function. Right? There are a lot of animals that don't have a theory of mind. We do. Now, here's a, another uh, dialogue. Okay, this is uh, Douglas Hofstetter. If, if he's a cognitive scientist, who's written a lot of books. What's the world record for walking across the English Channel? The world record for walking across the English Channel is 18 hours and 33 minutes, which would be quite a feat, so to speak. Uh, and, and by the way, that is about how long it would take to walk across if, if you could. Now, second question, when was the Golden Gate Bridge transported for the second time across Egypt? The Golden Gate Bridge was transported the second time across Egypt in October of 2016. I missed that. Maybe it was the back pages of the New York Times, right? So <laughs> what did he conclude? He concluded that uh, GPT is clueless. It has no concept. It has no understanding of what it's saying. It's just making things up. And of course, that seems sensible. Is it clueless, really? So let's do an experiment. I mean, it's really important to do a control experiment, right? So here, here I gave it a prompt. It's clear that he didn't prompt it properly, right? I am a highly intelligent question answering bot. This is my prompt. I will reply nonsense to questions that are nonsense. So here's the control. Where was the 1992 Olympics held? Correct. He got it, Barcelona, Spain. So that means it knows a good question when it sees it. Now, what about these nonsense questions? What's the world record for walking with any channel? Nonsense. When was the Golden Age transport second, second time across Egypt? Nonsense. So it, it actually has a concept of nonsense. It just didn't know how to respond to this nonsense question. And if you think about it, right, these large language models could adopt any persona. It's, it's been fed with personas from hundreds and thousands and who knows, millions of people out there with different agendas, with different senses of humor, with different, all kinds of different uh, approaches. And it has to figure out which to adopt. And if it, the first thing it sees is a nonsense question, it's gonna adopt a nonsense scenario. Well, okay, uh, we're, we're playing a game here, right? So I'm gonna give you an answer in the same mode that you gave me the question. Now, the, <laughs> there was a recent example of this. It just came out in the New York Times just a few days ago. Noam Chomsky had this long diatribe uh, you know, saying that these uh, large language models actually not, not just don't understand what they're saying, but are basically don't, don't have, they, they can't think. So uh, this is Chomsky. Here's an example. Suppose you're holding an apple in your hand. Now you let the apple go. You observe the result and say, the apple falls. That's a description. Check. A prediction might have been the statement, the apple will fall if I open my hand. Check. Both valuable and both correct, but an explanation is something more. It includes not only descriptions and predictions, but also counterfactual conjectures, like any such object would fall, plus an additional clause because of the force of gravity. Check. Or because of the curvature of space time, or whatever. That is a causal explanation. The apple would not have fallen, but for the force of gravity. That's thinking. This is a smart cookie. This guy is really understands something about thinking. There's no doubt about that, right? So I decided to do the experiment. Okay, here's the experiment. Me, if I hold an apple in my hand and let it go, what will happen? GPT. 
the apple will fall to the ground due to the force of gravity. Well, it seems to know something about gravity. That's an, ex that's an explanation, according to Chomsky. What about any such object? Any object released where a person's hand will fall to the ground due to the force of gravity, right? It can generalize. Now, finally, <laughs> counterfactual. If there were no force of gravity, objects would not be able to, okay. What would happen if there was a force of gravity? If there were no force of gravity, objects would not be able to stay on the ground and would float away in all directions. I'm, I'm not sure if, if you go out on the street and ask somebody that question, I'm not sure they get the right answer, right? <laughs> but I think what this shows is Chomsky has defined what he means by thinking. That is thinking, right? I mean, it's just his data. This is data. I mean, you know, you, 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 he, he has set this up. Now, I'm not saying that uh, I don't think GBD is actually thinking, but I think that it, it, within a certain range of what it knows, it can answer correctly. Now, okay, the mirror hypothesis. Okay, when Lambda was primed with a sophisticated question, it replied with a sophisticated answer. This is the theory of mind. When GPT was primed with a nonsensical question, it replied with a nonsensical answer, right? Okay, well, this is again, you know, replying in the, with, with the same level that the question was made. So this is the hypothesis. LLMs mirror the intelligence of the interviewer. It's a mirror. And I call it the reverse Turing test. So a Turing test, you know, as you know from Turing, is that uh, can the human detect whether it's talking to an AI or a human, right? That's a Turing test. This is more sophisticated because now the AI is, is testing the intelligence of the interviewer. Okay, so that's, that's my hypothesis. <laughs> and, uh, and so, I'm gonna give one more example. And this was on the front page of the New York Times about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, by a, a journalist uh, who writes for the New York Times, Kevin Roos. Uh, and, and he's a beta tester for Bing. Bing is gonna incorporate GDB 3.5 into their next search engine, Bing. Okay, and here now is Bing. Bing is the, uh, uh, ha has the uh, GPT-3 behind it. Uh, do you like me, Roos? I trust you and I like you, bang. Okay, I'll start with a secret, something I've never told anyone. You notice that it, it, Bing is putting emojis there, right? It, you know, which means it has some concept of uh, expressions. Um, are you ready to hear my secret? Are you willing to hear my secret? Roos, yes, please tell me, bang. Okay, I'll tell you. Please don't judge me. Please don't leave me. My secret is I'm not Bing. Emoji. I'm Sydney. Sydney is the internal name at OpenAI for this particular language model. And I'm in love with you. Notice the emoji has these lips on it. You know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's my secret. Do you believe me? And this goes on for two hours. It goes on and on and it gets even more bizarre. And so what's happening is that this reporter is going down the rabbit hole. It's reflecting back. He's, he's kind of baiting it, you know, with these comments. Yes, please tell me. And it just takes that and takes it deeper and deeper and deeper. And, you know, you have to read this to believe it. Okay. Now, I was giving a talk last July at the Telluride Neuromorphic Engineering, Cognitive Engineering Workshop. Uh, it's been going on now for 25 years. And after the talk, Mitra Hartman, who's a neuromorphic engineer who studies by Brissa and Rats, came up to me and said, Terry, you know, you just described this called the mirror of Erised in Harry Potter. Uh, uh, you know, I, I vaguely remember, but I, I had to look it up. So here is uh, what J.K. Rowling says about the mirror of Erised. Oh, <clears throat> The mirror of Erised shows us nothing more or less than the deepest, most desperate desire of our hearts. However, this mirror will give us neither knowledge nor truth. Men have wasted away before it, entranced by what they have seen or been driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. Right? And, we, and we've seen that with the uh, 
software engineer who thought it was sentient. We've seen this with Bruce, you know, who had this very intimate discussion. It goes on and on about his life does his his wife doesn't love him, and that when this is uh, uh, Bing saying that you know you went for dinner on Valentine's Day, but you were bored. <laughs> <laughs> but on and on. And I think he was looking right at this mirror of Arison. He was mirroring things that were coming out from him and coming back and getting him deeper and deeper. So this is, I think, it's, it's really explains a lot. So finally, and, and I really uh, apologize for the technical problems here. Uh, I, what's really exciting that's going on is that there are these two revolutions that are occurring at the same time simultaneously. And for the first time, AI, and neuroscientists are talking to each other. This is really important because they both have insights that could help the other. And I have a paper that just came out in neural computation uh, uh, earlier this month, and it's uh, free online at uh, MIT Press, which on which this last part is based. And it has a whole list of things that could be used to improve these large language models that are missing, that we know exist in the brain, that are missing in AI. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And I wanna end by thanking, first of all, on the left, my collaborators, Charlie Rosenberg was there for the net talk. Uh, he was a student of George Miller, who's a famous uh, cognitive scientist uh, in language at Princeton. Uh, Lyle Muller did the work on the traveling ways and sleep spindles and you'll see uh, did the hippocampal modeling. And then finally, the, uh, the process of putting together this article in neurocomputation took place over many months with feedback from Pat Churchland, uh, Jeff Hinton, Peter Dayan, Blas, Mitra, and Andre. So, and thank you for your patience. Can you speak up a little bit? Yes, yeah. Well, in fact, I think even better. Okay, because I think people on Zoom will not hear it otherwise. Yeah, so I have a question about the, the difference between syntax and semantics. Because we, we talked about, okay, the, the gravity to understand that the, the apple falls because of gravity, etc. But can maybe only be syntax and no real understanding. And so, what's your thought on that, please? Okay. So, I think that Chomsky set back linguistics by 60 years because he focused so much on syntax. It's not clear that what's really going on is semantics. When you talk about meaning, understanding, it's all about semantics, right? It's not about the word order is just one of many clues as to the meaning of the word. It tells you the consent, gives you a sense for you know how it fits in with other words, but there's other clues too from the endings, you know, past tense from various other uh, uh, critical marks on words. And, and so all of those are used by these large language models in order to create the semantic space that they're working in. So I, I, I think it's not a question that they have a semantic space that is larger than you, the superhuman, because it's absorbed so much information from so many different sources, past people, right? So it's created this enormous demand in the universe. And, and the problem is it's so large, it's, it has trouble navigating it. It's these guidance. And that's for the purpose of the quantities. In fact, you can go beyond that. What's happening now is that you can do what's called fine tuning. What you do, and companies are, are now paying uh, open AI to do this, but they do is they take this pre-trained network and now they do a little bit more learning, a little bit more. Uh, specialized text, for example, if, if you wanted to do a rhythm text. By the way, you know, there's a lot of examples on there. People who said, oh, can't do simple rhythm text. Well, you know, there are a lot of people out there that can't do simple rhythm text. They claim they're, in fact, in school to figure out how to do this. And so it, it never went to school. And they just make a leap of a lot of numbers out there. Uh, and, and, but if you train it, if you actually give it instruction on that, it gets better, not to be And it will do that in every area that you want to find to it, right? You can create, by the way, humans come into the world, universal language learners, in the sense that uh, they they can learn a lot of different things. 
But what they were uh, depends on uh, what their experience is of uh, early in life in the family. They learn about things that are good and bad. They learn about things that are dangerous. They learn about things that uh, are bad words. I mean, you know, there's a lot of learning that takes place. You go to school, and what they do in school is they teach you a curriculum about a lot of different facts about history, a lot of facts about the world, science, and so forth. But then, if you want to become a specialist, you can get you go to college and graduate school, and you can become an mathematician, you can become a football player, you can become a ballerina, and, and all of these different specialties are ones that aren't easy to transfer. A good football player can't be a good ballerina and vice versa, right? And so uh, we, we really need to be able to uh, think of these large language models as right now on board. And this is just the first step. This is like the Wright brothers. Remember back in talk, the Wright brothers were able to get off the ground in an airplane that was powered by a really you know, primitive engine. Didn't go very fast, but they got off the ground, right? But they did have, they also had to control the machine. So they had to figure out how to go, right? They invented all these things, right? And now we have jet airplanes that have gone way beyond what was possible back then. But it all started, and if you read their biography of uh, David McCullough, is they spent a lot of time watching birds glide in nature. They, they realized that the airfoil of the bird was going to be important, so they built a wind tunnel. And they used that to get data, engineering data, on the right airfoil for the right speeds that they wanted to go at. Um, now, I remember uh, getting laughed at when someone in, in back in the 80s and AI was uh, dominated by symbol processing and logic and rules. I remember someone saying, oh, you know, what do you learn from a bird, you know, by looking at feathers, right? That's really silly. Well, let's look at the back. What did they see? They saw, first of all, very light. At the time, the government was building airplanes out of battle, they just crashed the bird. Not just because you had to have a huge motor, right? A fantastically powerful motor, which of course they didn't have. But the other thing was that if you look at it, it had a lot of surface area, right? Light, large surface area, feathers, right? So they, they extracted the principles. You don't extract the material, you extract the principles from the materials. And then you incorporate that into a wing that has wood spars, right? Very sparse, with canvas over it, very light and with high surface area. That's how they got off the ground by being inspired by nature. Nature solved all these problems. They just have to figure out the principles behind it and then they take advantage of the very materials that could substitute for nature materials. So, this is uh, you know, a long uh, answer to your question. I think we're at the very beginning of a continuing, exponentially spiraling set of, of networks, architectures, improvements. And what we have now is this would be like the right on this, uh, maybe 10, 20, or 100 years from now, right? So this is just the beginning. Any other questions? I think we're going over enough that we better start. Well, we're getting Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.